not every uh, Jewish person celebrated God the same way, right? There were different sects. There were the Sadducees, there were the Pharisees, and other different groups. And so what would happen is, if you wanted to meet, you would go to the temple. And so some groups would meet on this side, some would meet here, some would meet uh, there. And so what I want you to see is this big gathering place where all the people are, and now this is the very, uh, it's a very special day. This is the day of Pentecost. And what happens at 6 a.m., they come and they celebrate Pentecost. They begin uh, to give these sacrifices up to the Lord and pray. And then at about 9 o'clock, there is a break in that. And do you know what happens at 9 o'clock? Uh, history tells us that they begin reading the Scripture. Now, when you hear the passage that they I, they read it's going to blow your mind. Okay, are you ready for your minds to blow? Exodus chapter 19. You can turn there and again put your bookmark in Acts because we're coming right back there. They read Exodus chapter 19 and 20, and they read Ezekiel. Now, obviously, we don't have time to read all of that today, but I want us to look at Exodus chapter 19. In verse 16, for those of you that don't know, it's the second book in the Bible, Exodus 19 and verse 16. Here it says, on the morning of the third day, now this is when the people of God, they're about to receive the Ten Commandments, and on the morning of the third day, there was a thunder. Now, here's a really cool thing. Did you know that the Hebrew word for that is the same word that they would use to translate voice or voices, okay? So on the morning of the third day, there was thunder or voices and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke. Now catch this. Because the Lord did what? Descended on it with fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew, grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. So all around the temple, these groups are meeting, and they are reading Exodus 19, and they're remembering when the, the Ten Commandments are giving, and they're hearing the story of God descending. In fire. Now look at Ezekiel. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. Because they read Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 2. And I just want to uh, point a few verses to you. And I want you to picture this. They're in a group together. Imagine the 120 uh, disciples of God gathered together. They're, they're waiting. They've already offered their sacrifices and now they're meeting together, and they are reading Ezekiel chapter 1. And let's look at verse 4. Giving you a chance to turn there. I'm sorry. I looked, and I saw a wind storm. How does the Holy Spirit of God come? Acts 2. It's like a, a strong, mighty wind. I saw a wind storm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning, Surrounded by brilliant light, the center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was look, what looked like four living creatures. Skip down to verse 13. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of of lightning. Okay, so you see another picture of the fire. Now they're all reading this. Now I want you to catch chapter 2, and this is important because this is where I'm heading in a little bit. Ezekiel chapter 2. Here's what the Lord says to Ezekiel Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. And he spoke, and as he spoke, the Spirit came into me. You hear that? Let's say that again. As he spoke, the Spirit came into Ezekiel and raised him to his feet 
and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. Those miserable Israelites. I can't believe that they would rebel against the Lord. I'm so thankful that we don't do that. Right? You know, sometimes we can have the tendency to look at that, look at the scripture and say, oh, those people, they rebelled against the Lord. But hello, look, look around today. What do we see? God's principles, people just snubbing their nose, going the complete opposite direction. God wants me to do it. I'm going to do the exact opposite thing. We are a people that rebels against God. Now, when the Spirit of God comes on us, He might challenge us in the same way to be sent to rebellious people. Verse 4. Actually, let's get to verse 6. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. Now stop and think about the disciples. Their Lord, their Savior, Jesus, was crucified on a cross. Peter was so fearful that he denied even knowing Jesus because he was afraid of what would happen to him. They were living in this fear, but yet after Jesus came and appeared to them again, things were different. Peter was a different person after that. Now imagine, here they are praying. God told them, I want you to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And are they questioning in their mind, how, am, how are we going to do this with, with all this happening around us? And imagine, they are reading this scripture. Don't be afraid of their words. Don't be afraid the briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Don't be afraid of what they say or terrified by them, though they are rebellious people. That's not applicable for today, is it? Do we struggle with that? How many of you teens have struggled with that? God wants you to speak something. You friends, your friends are doing something that you know is wrong. You know God could be the thing that could change their life. And you're struggling with fear. It's like, what if I say this? What if I stand up and say, you know, I don't do that. What if I say, I love God. Do you struggle with fear? Adults, do you ever struggle with fear to say what Christ is to you? This is applicable for us today. Verse 8, But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. Now catch this. I love this. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And what is he given? He's given a scroll which represents the word of God. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, what happens? He fills us to overflowing he fills our mouth with words, and then we speak those words out. That's the gift of tongues. And I love the fact that they are reading this around the 9 o'clock time when the Spirit of God is given. So let's go back to that account, Acts chapter 2, and read this together. When the day, Acts, I'll give you a chance to get there, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. giving you a workout right here. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Now picture this in your mind. Uh, in the scripture in Acts, it talks about Solomon's colonnade or Solomon's porch. It's an area on the side of the temple. So this might have been one of the meeting places where they were meeting. So when the day of Pentecost came, when they had already offered their, their sacrifices, they were all together. Now, you know what happens after church? Some amazing things happen after church. Some of you will fellowship up here. Some of you have a missions uh, committee meeting, and so you go downstairs and you meet downstairs. Some of you are preparing for VBS, so you meet on one side. The youth get together, and they do something. What's happening? This is a meeting place, right? 
Afterwards, we get some things done. We fellowship. And so this is happening in the temple area. All around, people are meeting in different groups. But yet, the church, the early church of God, they are all together. They're not fellowshipping all around. They are here in one place, and they're doing one thing. They're seeking for the gift that God was going to give them. And it says, Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they're sitting. Wait a minute. Pastor Joel, what about the house? We, we looked at all of this. Why does it say house? If you were to ask a Jewish person today what they call the temple, they might respond, the house of God. As I was studying this, that was the point that was brought up over and over again. The temple is referred to as the house. So imagine, and it can refer to a place. So here they are, and it filled the whole place where they were sitting. So they're sitting on one of those benches that they're, they're, they're reading the Word of God, they're praying, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes. Now, when you hear of the Spirit of God coming into the temple of God, you should get a little bit excited, right? Think back what happened when they turned away from God. The Spirit departed. And this time, the Spirit of God is coming inside of the temple. But even more specifically, where is the temple now? It's in me. It's in you. And so it's filling that early church in the temple of their hearts. So it filled the whole house where they were sitting they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Can you imagine some people that are around, all of a sudden they're reading Exodus uh, chapter 19, and one of them is, is reading for other people to hear, and, and God came down like fire, and then all of a sudden they hear the sound, and they begin looking, and fire falls down from heaven, and attention... Just to imagine, we have meetings here after church, some meet over here, some over here. Imagine, you're talking, and then all of a sudden you hear this noise, and you look, and you see fire falling down from heaven. What are you going to do? Let's go back and talk. No, you see people running. What's going on? And they begin to, to run over and see what is happening, and then all of a sudden they see the fire descending and resting on each one of the people, the 120 people that are there, the fire of God falls on them. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them, as the Spirit gave them those words. Now, it goes on to say that there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language, utterly amazed. Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? And there's the list of all the different people that are there. And let's skip down to uh, verse 11. Both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them saying the Lord's Prayer over and over again. What? Is that right? That's what happens in A.D., I'm sorry. It says here, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Now imagine being there, you rush over, and then all of a sudden you hear somebody speaking your language. How many of you have been to a foreign country? You have, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> now have you met anybody here that speaks your language? Okay. I know I, I had an opportunity to go to uh, a Spanish-speaking country, and I, I took Spanish for like two or three years, but still very struggling to, to hear key words. But I remember out of the whole crowd hearing one person that 
spoke English. I could pick it out. Why? Because our ears are listening for something that we understand. So in this crowd of 120 people, people at the top of their lungs shouting praise to God, all of a sudden they're hearing their language. Hey, they know my language. They're praising God. And it's grabbing their attention right there. But let's just stop and think. What about the people that don't speak that same language? I tell you, there's some pretty wild uh, languages out there. Uh, somebody was telling me about a different language that part of their dialect is like, you know, that's part of their language. Now, to me, that sounds crazy. But for them to listen to me, they probably think, wow, that's crazy. They don't tick or pop. What's wrong with it? You know, for us, it sounds like they're crazy. They don't know what they're saying. It's just gibberish, right? Why? Because we don't know their language, right? And in the same way, that's what takes place in verse uh, 12 to 13. It says, some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Their, their speech is slurring. They don't even know what they're saying. Why? Because they don't understand that language. Now, some of you here today, when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming down, maybe you've never been filled before, and you've heard somebody speaking in tongues, and you're like, that's crazy. They're just making that up in their mind. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. The only reason why you don't know is because you don't know that language, right? And it's the same way the things that were happening then still happen today. Now, all of that, I'm leading somewhere, and it's the message. After the Holy Spirit is given in power, people are baptized, then Peter stands up. And I want you to read this with me because the message of Peter is the message I want to talk to you about today. Starting in uh, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. So picture this. They're, they're in the temple, and people are gathering all around them. They are amazed at what's happened. They've seen the fire. They've heard the praises of God in their own language. And he says, fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem... Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Again, that gives us the time, that break in the, the Feast of Pentecost. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Let's stop right there. Previous to this time, the Holy Spirit was still on the scene, right? This is not the first time the Holy Spirit is given. If you look out uh, through, through Scripture, you know, the Holy Spirit comes upon different individuals. You remember Saul, right? The Spirit of God came upon Saul. So what happened in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit came on certain people at certain times for certain purposes. But what is being said here through the prophet Joel and reiterated through Peter is now it's not going to be just certain people. It's on everyone. Your sons and daughters. I have some sad, sad news for you. Back in that time, you guys weren't valued as, as much as you are today's time. The younger you are, the less respect you got. Okay, and, and our society, sometimes it's got it completely flipped. And so for them to say, your sons and daughters, even your young sons and daughters, God's going to pour out His Spirit on them. There's no difference between men and women. It's not just going to be on the men. It's going to be on the women. Matter of fact, let's go to the lowest. Even your servants, men servants and lady servants, the Spirit of God is going to be poured out on them, and they will prophesy exciting that's for us today you know, maybe that was just for back then right no what is it what is said right here uh, verse 17 it says in the what last days did jesus come back while i wasn't looking no he has not come back yet 
So we are still living in the last days. And so that means that we're still living in the time where God wants to pour out His Spirit on all of us. Now, notice where he turns here. He continues what Joel is saying, and this is very important. He says, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. What is he saying right here? I'm pouring out my spirit right now on people, but guess what? God is coming back, and there's going to be judgment happening right at the end there. Now, that's very important because we're going to see where he goes from this. Let's look back at the scripture. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. So what's the whole purpose of this address? First and foremost, he wants people to come to Christ. Anybody with me there? That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. This is the message of the gospel. Freeing him from the agony of death because it is impossible for death to keep a hold on him. Now, I didn't tell you something. So, Pentecost, they look at the giving of the Ten Commandments that they believe happens at that time. They look at Exodus, you know, and Ezekiel, we talked about that. Did you know what else they believe about that day? They believe that David was born and died on the day of Pentecost. Okay? Now notice what Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says next, while this is fresh on their minds. Verse 25, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will live in hope. Why? Because you will not abandon me to the grave. Again, what are they celebrating? The birth and death of David. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. He says, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. All 120 people. Matter of fact, in the scripture, it tells us that over 400 people saw Jesus resurrected, and they're saying, we are witnesses of this. We've seen him, his resurrected body. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now here's his conclusion for his message. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So that's his, his point. He is the Christ. He's wanting people to come to, to Christ. How do the people respond? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now, notice what Peter doesn't say. He doesn't say, receive the love of Jesus. Start in a new relationship with Jesus. Jesus loves you so much. Those are all very true things. But what does Peter tell them in response? Verse 38, Peter replied what? Repent. Those are dirty words in the church today, aren't they? We don't want to hear that. 
We want to hear about the loving Jesus that all you got to do is say the magic prayer and that's and then you're good. But what does the scripture say? What does Peter say? Repent. That means change direction. You've got to come to that place where you realize your sin because when you realize your sin, you see your need for Christ. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now let's just talk for a minute. How many people were added to the church that day? 3,000. And they were all what? Baptized. Where in the world could that possibly happen? Did you know at the temple there was a thing called the mikvah? It's basically a ceremonial washing where people would come and they could be baptized or go through the mikvah right there. Some people have suggested that they took use of that right there. Otherwise, you could have had the 120 people go in different places and baptize all the people. But the point was, when they were baptized, it was symbolic of the washing away of what? You mean they sinned? Yeah. They had to repent. So it was a washing away of the sins and a bringing back to life. It was a repentance that took place. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Is the gift for today? Yes. It's for all generations until Jesus comes back. Now, if you want to know what is his heart's cry, look at verse 40 and 41. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Does that sound like he believed that everybody was going to be saved? That everybody was basically good people? No. It says here, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Does that ring with anybody's hearts today when I look around me there's some our, our world is in a pretty bad state right things that are clearly sin and the word of God are being called good that's why we need to repent we need to save with Jesus help save ourselves from this corrupt generation verse 41 says those who accepted his message were baptized in about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, I need to close, but I want to look at one quick scripture. Look at Acts chapter 4. And I want you, actually, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 3 and verse 17. We know that when Peter and John were coming back to the temple on a separate occasion, there was a, a blind, I mean, a, a lame man, and God used him to heal this lame man, and then they are questioned about this by the people. And I want you to hear this, this one last thing, and we'll close, and then uh, Melmy and Brianna, if you don't mind coming forward, play something. It says, now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. He just told them, you know, you're, you're responsible for crucifying Jesus. This death is on you. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Now, look at verse 19. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Again, he has the second opportunity. He doesn't plead with them with the love of Jesus, even though he has extended his love to us. He confronted them with their sin, and he told them, you must repent. And where do we see the love of Jesus in this? Read it again, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And notice this last part, that times of refreshing may come for the Lord. I'm going to stop. There's more that we could talk about. But notice that. Repent so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come to the Lord. What I want to say here today and I know probably most of you have a relationship with Christ maybe you are all set but I want to tell you today the scripture is clear you cannot continue in sin and everything be okay you can't simply 
say, you know, Jesus loves everybody and think that that's okay. The call from Peter on two different occasions at the beginning of the church is this, repent so that you can receive forgiveness of God so that there will be times of refreshing. Now, when you hear that word so that there will be times of refreshing, what does that tell you of current condition? Dry, parched, hurting, and pain. So all I want to say here, I'm going to go ahead and preach it even though I don't know if there's anybody here that fits this. Some of you might be in pain. You may be parched. You may feel dry on the inside because you are not right with God. I'm not going to stand here and lie to you and tell you everything is going to be okay. I'm going to in boldness tell you, you need to repent. You need to change direction. It's no fun living in the place that you're in. God wants to send his refreshing to you, but you must repent. Would you stand with me? I, I talked to a few of you guys over here. Would you mind just coming forward to the altar right now? You know what God told Ezekiel? He said, I want you to speak your words to a rebellious people. They may not listen to you, but you still speak that word. So that's what we're doing today. We are speaking that word to repent because, because that's what God wants for you to do. You have that choice. You don't have to come. We may have absolutely no person that's coming here, but I believe that there is someone here or several people here that God is speaking to you. You need to repent and come to Him. So, with eyes wide open, I'm looking for bold people who are tired of living in the dryness and the pain of your sin. You want to repent and come to Christ. Is there anybody here that God's speaking to you? You need to repent and come to Him. sin, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. God just simply wants us to repent and come to Him. Anybody else? Ladies? change in your life. There's a whole lot of pain ahead. There's hell, but God sent His Son to die on the cross to save you from your sins. He was resurrected, showing that He has the power over the grave. So I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm asking today uh, for the rest of this altar call that if you need the boldness of God, you want a, a fresh feeling of His power in your life to be bold for Him, or maybe God's dealing with you because up to this point, you're moving in timidity. You're not standing.